Hi, in this presentation I'm going to talk about numbness in the hands and fingers that is caused by your occupation or hobby, or in many cases both. Not something caused by a medical condition, such as a blow to the head, a brain tumor, a stroke, uh, MS, lupus, or many other medical conditions. And sometimes things like diabetes, which has neuropathy, if you have diabetes, but you can also have numbness caused by your occupation or hobbies, and that was often disguised as just being diabetes when you might have problems from both. So in this presentation, I will talk about carpal tunnel syndrome and false carpal tunnel syndromes. And actually, false carpal tunnel syndromes are really on the rise, and I'll tell you why. And the big picture of why you have numbness in your hand is often missed by doctors who are looking for a quick symptom fix. It is often looked, overlooked by um, nerve conductivity tests because the why you have a problem and the cause is somewhere between the fact that you play the guitar too much or you type too much or, or you weight lift and the numbness in the hands. There's something going on in between that's causing the symptoms of carpal tunnel or false carpal tunnels. I'll talk about why anti-inflammatory drugs have never, ever, ever cured carpal tunnel syndrome and why they can actually make your problem worse in the long run. I will talk about some of the myths about carpal tunnel syndrome. I will talk about what I call the dimmer switch theory and why surgery is not often a magic bullet in a quick fix like some people think it is and why these stretches that you see for carpal tunnel uh, well, they could be a good thing for you. They are often very slow and time-consuming and inefficient, and there are better ways. So who am I? My name is Hilma Volk. I am the creator of Carpal Tunnel Master, and I was a massage therapist for 23 years, and I started my Carpal Tunnel Master program in 2010. I retired from doing massage in 2015 and I'm also a certified nutrition coach but I'm not going to talk about nutrition really. So I didn't start massage school until I was 40 and before that I was doing many things but one of the main things was working with horses and you know lifting bales of hay, lifting 50 pound bags of grain, lifting saddles, brushing horses, sometimes getting injured. And I thought I couldn't do that forever so I went to massage school age 40. And the first day of massage class the instructor said that carpal tunnel syndrome was a hazard for massage therapists. Well I'm from the sticks and I didn't even know what carpal tunnel syndrome was and there was a gal in the class who had surgery on both hands and I wondered why she was taking the class, but she explained some things about it to me. And later on there was a gal who came in looking for uh, someone to trade three massages for her homemade massage table because she had had a very lucrative practice of massage in California and, as she said, her wrist had blown out. Whatever that means. Well, in massage school we had classes taught by a massage therapist who did the practical stuff, but there was also courses in anatomy and physiology and diseases and kinesiology and so forth that were taught by chiropractors. And in our disease class there was a discussion on carpal tunnel and our chiropractor instructor mentioned that he could cure carpal tunnel syndrome. But the discussion was only about carpal tunnel and nothing else and I thought I knew a lot about carpal tunnel syndrome. As it turned out I didn't know diddly. Many years later I was working at a resort, uh, actually a few years later I was working at a big resort and the shifts at the beginning were 10 hours long and I started developing numbness in my hands. And because I believed there was a cure besides surgery and not wanting to go the medical practice route, I did a lot of research on my own. I found books, I found magazines, I looked there all over the internet, I saw good information, bad information, but most of it was statistics of who gets it, how they get it, why they get it, and all that kind of stuff. Well, 
not much on the way of solving problems. They did show some stretches, which really didn't help me any. And the only thing that really helped me was icing. And because I'm a massage therapist, I know that the icing wasn't just here. It was the whole forearm area, which I'll explain later. But the one thing I saw that really helped was I was watching a video on YouTube from a rowing team. And, you know, you know these rowboats that, uh, you know, there's a crew boat and there's like 10 or 12 or whatever number, and they're stroke, 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 and they were getting numb hands. And they found out by using their thumb across here, uh, they could solve their problem to a large extent. Well, I tried it and it helped, but the problem is I was a massage therapist and my poor thumbs were overworked. So I developed a technique to work on myself that did not use my hands because my hands were already overworked. And wow, it worked beautifully. But then I had another problem which I'll talk about a little later. <laughs> First, let me explain what is carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel is a ditch in the wrist made up of wrist bones and a strap across the front that's called the carpal tunnel ligament or transverse carpal tunnel ligament and that's what they split when you have carpal tunnel surgery to make more room in the carpal tunnel area and through that carpal tunnel is nine flexor tendons flexors muscles are the ones that close your hand and the flexor tendons are, well, I'll describe that later too. The extensors are what open your hands. Well, most people use their flexors a lot stronger than they use the extensors. You are playing the piano, you're typing, you're doing things squeezing, and muscle imbalance develops. Now there's two main reasons for true carpal tunnel and there's also false carpal tunnel <laughs> syndrome as well that can often mimic carpal tunnel syndrome. So if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, you'll have numbness in the thumb, first finger, second finger, and half of the ring finger and part of the palm. But anyway, when you move your hands up and down, like in typing or playing a musical instrument, what causes the motion in your fingers? Almost all the motion, except things like sideways motion, is caused by your forearm muscle. And you can easily tell that by holding, squeezing your upper forearm and move your hands up and down, move your wrist up and down, move your fingers up and down, and feel what's going on in the forearm. Those forearm muscles are moving those fingers. And how do they do that? Well, They've got long skinny tendons that go through the carpal tunnel. But they're not just plain tendons, they're long skinny tendons and they go through a hollow tube called a sheath. And when you contract the muscles up here in the front of your forearm, that makes the different fingers go down. Well, inside those tendon sheaths there's lubrication called synovial fluid. So you know that if you have an engine and there's motor oil, uh, that motor oil lubricates the pistons that go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. If your motor oil dries out, your engine ceases up and you've got a ruined engine. Well, inside those tendon sheaths, the synovial fluid is not motor oil. It can dry out and it can dry out fairly quickly. So if you're typing or playing a musical instrument uh, for a long period of time, uh, that synovial fluid dries out. This is a tip. If you're playing a musical instrument or whatever, every 20 minutes you should stop and do something else for five minutes so you're not doing repetitive things with your hand. Why? Because you don't want your fluid to dry out in there or else They'll be grinding, they'll be chafing, they'll be part of the cells of either the sheath or the tendon to slough off. And what happens? It gets irritated, that swells up, causing less room in the carpal tunnel. <laughs> and you want to keep that nice and lubricated by allowing the synovial fluid to rehydrate itself. 
So you don't have, that doesn't mean you have to quit working. You can save your phone calls for those five minutes. You can take a bathroom break. You can do filing, talk to your boss. Do something else for five minutes every 20 minutes if you are constantly doing repetitive things with your fingers. People say repetitive work doesn't cause carpal tunnel syndrome. Yes, it can if you're doing it wrong. Okay? And the other thing is, most people that I've seen type wrong. What you should do is have the back of your hand and the back of your forearm in a straight line. You don't want those tendons going around corners. You don't want them going this way or that way. Not this way, not that way. A lot of people, they will rest their wrist on the desk and type with their hands up. And you don't want your wrist resting. They sell wrist rests, but even the manufacturers of those things often don't know that they're not for resting your wrist on when you're typing. They are for resting your wrist when you're not typing, just to have a softer surface. So, very important to float your hands over top the keyboard. Same with musical instruments, as much as possible, have the straight line here. Why? Because your tendons have to go around corners, and it's like a rope around a tree branch. Something's going to slough off. You don't want that. Now, many people have numb hands carpal tunnel or whatever, from more than one cause. They play guitar, they lift weights, they do other things, they garden, knit, whatever, and they have an occupation that isn't so conducive to, <laughs> to your hands. There's a lot of occupations uh, that cause problems with hands. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome has been around for a long time, uh, meat packers, musicians, whatever. And the thing is, when people have muscle problems or hand problems or whatever, they don't think about the long-term cause. Because I'll talk to somebody who played the guitar and they were weightlifting also, and they stopped weightlifting three months ago. And they don't think that could be a possible cause because three months have gone. But what have they done to loosen the muscles? Because let's take weightlifting. When you're weightlifting or using a machinery that vibrates, or doing other gripping stuff, you're using the forearm muscles. It's not repetitive, but it is using the forearm muscles. And what happens when the forearm muscles get tight? And they can get, and they can get tight from repetitive use as well. In fact, they usually do. And that creates muscle imbalance. Now what happens when there's muscle imbalance? These muscles in the front get tighter. And they also develop Adhesions. What are adhesions? They're like knots, but it's muscle fibers stuck together. They also have trigger points, which are muscle cells stuck in contraction. And they can build up and become very tender, and they also shorten your muscle. What happens when they shorten the muscles? They pull the carpal tunnel forward, because the, these muscles also pull the wrist forward. So what happens when the wrist is pulled forward? you have problems in the carpal tunnel. Now muscle imbalance is the main reason for a lot of pain in your body. Whether it's knee pain, ankle pain, neck pain, whatever. And how many doctors have you been to, how many medical doctors have actually felt your muscles? Probably none unless it's a very rare medical doctor. Because if you have a headache, what are they going to give you? A prescription or pain pillars or anti-inflammatory drugs or whatever when they're not looking at the cause usually or they'll take a brain scan whatever when most headaches are caused by tight muscles if the muscles over here are tight you'll have a headache up here muscles over here you have headache here muscles in the back of your neck uh, back of your skull you get headaches up here and there's other causes of headaches if if you're a coffee drinker and you're denied coffee for a while, you might get a caffeine headache, which goes away if you drink caffeine. So, instead of looking at the causes, a lot of times they're just masking the symptoms. And the same is true with carpal tunnel syndrome. And a lot of times it's not even carpal tunnel syndrome at all. Now, the reason is, is because the nerves 
that go down your arm, start with the lower vertebrae of the neck, go underneath your collarbone, down under your armpit, down your arm, and into your fingers. Now some people say, well, carpal tunnel <laughs> syndrome starts here and it goes up the forearm. No. Very few people realize how tight their muscles are until they actually are pushing on them. If you've ever gotten a massage, and I don't mean a namby-pamby slide and glide massage, but someone really works your muscles and you go, oh, I didn't know that hurt. Well, muscles go under the radar and unless they're really tight, they don't talk to you. But if they're tight and they can cause problems with your carpal tunnel or whatever, and then you feel the tightness. Or they might say, then it shows up in my shoulder. No, it doesn't work that way. Let's say you bang your elbow, your funny bone. That, <laughs> ow, you know, that causes a sensation to go down into your fingers, really the little two fingers here, which is a problem, but it's not carpal tunnel, it's the ulnar nerve. But you bang your funny bone, you'll feel it there and you'll feel it in your fingers. You're not going to feel it up here because it doesn't work that way. So problems in the shoulder, the forearm, they're not starting from the carpal tunnel. They're starting from either the forearm or here or there or here. And it's like a dimmer switch. And I'll tell you about the dimmer switch theory. Okay, let's say you had a lamp. And if you know what a dimmer switch is, of course, you turn it one way, the lamp gets dimmer because it's restricting the amount of electricity that goes through the wire. You turn it the other way, the light gets brighter. Now let's say you had an electric outlet over there and a lamp over there, and in between you had five different dimmer switches, and the lamp was kind of dim. Now you could not tell by looking at the lamp whether one switch is dimmed or whether they all were a little dimmed, or which ones, or maybe two of them were, maybe three of them were. Uh, and you could not tell, the lamp couldn't tell. The only way you could tell is by examining each little dimmer switch. And our muscles, well our nerves are the same way. Our nerves are like electrical wires. They transmit sensations. And if anywhere along the pathway there's blockages, and I don't mean up here, I mean down here, or here, or here, or there, or here. You feel the sensation of numbness or tingling, or whatever. And you cannot tell by feeling your fingers what's causing it. Your brain doesn't know. Your fingers don't know. You could rub your fingers until you're blue in the face, and it won't do any good. And if your problem is coming from here, you can loosen up the forearms all you want and it won't do any good if you think you've got carpal tunnel syndrome because it'll make your forearms feel good. But if that's not where the problem is coming from, it's not going to help at all. And what has happened in some cases, and it happens way too often, and it amazes me that it does, is that it was totally misdiagnosed to begin with. In that the problem might have been coming from here, or here, or somewhere else, and they got the surgery, and guess what? Surgery didn't make any difference. And oftentimes, there's multiple places. And chiropractors call it a double crunch syndrome being here and here, but actually there can be more than one place. Now, let me tell you about what I was going to tell you before about another problem I had. When I was at the spa, there was something we did called reflexology, which, if you may know, is something you do with people's feet. And I hated doing it, not because of the feet. I didn't mind working on feet, but because when I was sitting low, having my arms up, working on feet, within five minutes, my whole hand got numb. I could still function, but I couldn't feel my fingers, really. And then, as soon as I was done, put my arms down, a uh, problem would go away. So I worked on my forearms more. Um, with my no hands method and made my forearms feel really good, but it didn't help. And then I took a continuing education course, which was really had nothing to do with this, but it was on deep tissue, and he was showing how to massage somebody's pectoralis minor. Well, the pectoralis minor is in here, and it's one of the places that can squeeze on the nerve. And he was showing us how to work on somebody's 
Dr. Alice Minor mentioned, and very casually mentioned, that it was a place where false carpal tunnel syndrome could occur. Thing is, I looked through all my muscle books, the anatomy books, everything I could, and there was no place that said that the pectoralis minor could do that. Some other things that the pectoralis minor can do that's actually more common is if you've ever had pain between your shoulder blades and you've gotten a massage, uh, that's actually caused by this muscle here which pulls your shoulders forward. And because it's pulling your shoulders forward, the muscles in between your shoulder blades are trying to pull back. And they can't because they're being pulled forward. So what happens uh, when muscles are getting tired? Well, muscles work. Even though they're not looking like they're working. For example, if you're holding your head down like this, these muscles are working. But after a while, these muscles get tired of working and they put out fluid and when the fluid goes away uh, little tiny muscle fibers get stuck together. It's like glue and they build up and then you get knots and then your neck has all these knots in it and you try to pull your neck shorter and, and it won't do it. So you get a massage, you get those knots worked out, it feels good and pretty soon you've got problems between your shoulder blades again because these muscles have not been addressed and you can have a hundred or a thousand massages and chances are nobody has worked on this muscle. And if it's tight, you would know it. <laughs> because it can be very painful, it is. If it is. And because we work in front of our bodies, these muscles get rounded. These shoulders get rounded. Now, I was mentioning a big problem that's more common than carpal tunnel syndrome is uh, these muscles up here if they're tight, they can push on the nerve that goes down your arm, the artery that goes down your arm, and the vein that brings the blood up. And this is the most common thing that mimics carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, pectoralis minor, very common too. A uh, place in your arm called the pronator teres, which if you work on your forearms, you'll hit that too. So it doesn't matter <laughs> as long as you're getting it. So these are your dimmer switches. And how to find the dimmer switches is very important because, like I said, if you think it's coming from here and you do all these stretches for carpal tunnel, ah, uh, that won't work. And let me just talk about stretching too. Muscles do like stretching and stretching is very good for them, but there's a problem with stretching is because they're inefficient and they take a long time. Why? Because let's say you had a muscle. And part of the muscle had little knots in it, and you stretch the muscle. And the happy part of the muscle stretch really easy. So let's say you're done stretching. Those unhappy parts have hardly been touched at all. So it takes a lot more persistence with stretching to get at those knots and get rid of them. And a lot of people don't have that kind of patience. It takes more time and persistence. It will work over time. But it's not the most efficient thing. Because I'm a massage therapist, you know, and I've worked on people's knots and whatever, I've noticed that, you know, you can unhook those knots a lot quicker through massage than you can <laughs> through stretching or just about anything else. And people say, oh, massage, that's, I've had massages, they don't do anything. Well, a slide and glide massage, a namby pamby massage, and won't help you at all and most massage therapists are not problem solvers. You know, <laughs> this is not something that's taught in massage school. It's not, it's not something I learned in massage school even though I took continuing education courses on hands. It wasn't even taught there, lo and behold. So what do doctors do about carpal tunnel? Well, one thing that some doctors do, but not all, is prescribe anti-inflammatory drugs. And drugs have never, ever, ever cured carpal tunnel syndrome. Why? <laughs> because let's say there's gunk in your tendons here. Your brain sends in macrophages to clean that gunk up. Now, if you keep on irritating it, it's not going to get cleaned up. So that's why it's important to take breaks and whatever. But 
there are things called macrophages that can ooze in and out of just about anything. They can gobble up dead skin cells. They can gobble up any kind of dead cells. They can gobble up bacteria. They can even gobble up pieces of metal. But if you're taking anti-inflammatory drugs, you're just masking the symptoms. It feels good for a while, but your brain does not know to send the help in. It's like you're having a, a fire and the firemen are asleep in the firehouse and the fire alarm never rings. So the fire doesn't get put out. Same darn thing. So anti-inflammatory drugs do not work. What does help is icing, unless you have a disease that where you can't use ice. Ice is a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps promote healing. And a funny thing, well, I'll talk about surgery later and ice. <laughs> but that's uh, one thing. What else do doctors recommend? Oftentimes they'll recommend night splints. And this is actually a good idea. This is a splint, and the reason it's helpful is, oops, it keeps the carpal tunnel open while you're sleeping. These are only for sleeping. So the problem when you're sleeping is your hand can flop around, and when your hand's like this, it closes the carpal tunnel. So, you know, if you've got a problem in there, it's going to make the problem worse and you've got numbness in the sleep. Now if this helps when you're sleeping, that's a good indication that your problem is coming from the forearm because what do the forearm does? Do? <laughs> what does the forearm do? do? Because what does the forearm do? It moves your wrist and fingers but also moves the wrist. So that's preventing that, keeping it open, keeping it so, so you can sleep better. Does it cure anything? No, it's not curing anything. You might think you're getting better because you can sleep better at night, but it's not a cure. So what else do they do? They give cortisone shots, and cortisone is a very powerful anti-inflammatory, and often it will help for a short period of time. Could be two months, could be a lot longer, but usually the symptoms come back. And the problem with cortisone shots is it's nothing to be fooled of. It can be dangerous. Most medical doctors will not prescribe cortisone shots more than twice in the same place in your body in your lifetime. Why? Because it's very, it's very powerful. It can deteriorate tendons, muscle, even bone. So it's nothing to be fooled with, but it can help on a temporary basis. The other thing they do is surgery. Now, surgery is probably done much more often than it should be. I'm not the only one saying that, but what they do in surgery is they slit this carpal tunnel, transverse carpal tunnel ligament. And the reason you're born with this is for gripping. It provides leverage when you grip. And when you cut that, your grip is weaker. And it's not an instant bullet. Even though the surgery might only take 15 minutes, and it might cost, you know, $7,000, $14,000, and your copay might be $3,000. But what happens after surgery is, okay, they slit that for a couple days, you're in, a, in bandages, and you're supposed to ice it 20 minutes for every hour, and then after that, for the next two weeks, ice it for 20 minutes several times a day. Personally, I think if you iced it that much, before you had the surgery, you probably wouldn't need the surgery. But anyway, <laughs> that's to recover from the trauma of the surgery because anytime there's anything invasive, you've got trauma. So there's usually swelling in there, you know, whatever. Occasionally there's infection, but I'm going to disregard that for now. But there's exercises you have to do. Most people who do light duty work, like typing, they can go back to work in two weeks. For anybody who has to carry 10 pounds or more, it could be two months, three months. And for industrial people, a lot of people can't go back, about 25% cannot go back to the same job they had before, and some people never recover. Uh, the main problem that people have, the main complaint, you know, five months after surgery is weakness of grip. It may take a year for that 
to get stronger if it does, because if it gets stronger, it's because scar tissue has built up in there. Scar tissue can also build up where you don't want it to, which causes problems later on, too. So it's not always a magic bullet. Now, websites don't really tell you what to do. They'll, they'll tell you to do stretches, or they'll tell you to do this or that. Very few will even mention ice. Uh, or they might say, try an acupuncturist, which it depends on what they know. Most people who try acupuncture, it doesn't help. A few people, it does help. I think it depends on who the acupuncturist is. Physical therapy um, can help people. Other people, uh, it depends on what the physical therapist knows, because if they're just giving you stretches for carpal tunnel syndrome without feeling your muscles, trying to figure out where your problem is coming from, they may not help at all. So some people are helped, some people are not helped at all, and it all depends on what the physical therapist knows. And I know of a lot of physical therapists uh, who are very good, and there are others who you know, I worked on people when I was a massage therapist. They were going to physical therapy for three months for a shoulder problem, which I fixed in two sessions because they were just giving stretches for shoulders in general, but they weren't figuring out the cause of the problem, which to me was a simple problem if you know what your muscles do. Okay, I digress. Well, they say that carpal tunnel syndrome is more common in women than men. And from what I've seen in my practice and with people, it's pretty evenly divided. But once computers came on the scene, personal computers, the amount of the ratio of women to men getting carpal tunnel was way skewed for women because more women were in the typing pool doing a lot more repetitive work, whereas uh, fewer men were doing that. Men were using computers, but not always without taking breaks, without problem solving or whatever, and also entering data, whatever. It was more women in the field doing that than men. So why were computers worse than typewriters? Typewriters, old typewriters, very seldom gave carpal tunnel syndrome. First of all, your hands were not resting on anything. They were floating over the keyboard. Even though they were harder to push the keys, if you type too fast, the keys would stick. If you, in, order to, in order to use the typewriter, you had to put the paper in, turn it down, or maybe click the carriage return, and then start typing. If you made a mistake, you got the whiteout or an eraser, or if you got carbon paper, then you got more problems. And <laughs> you could have a lot of mistakes with, with typing that you had to correct. Even if you were a good typer, even if you didn't make mistakes, you still had to go to the end of the line, hit a ding, you know, turn the carriage, get the paper out, put the paper away, and you had to do something with the paper. Eventually, you had to either stick it in an envelope or take it to your boss or take it to a filing cabinet or whatever. What happens with computers? There's nothing to slow you down. If you need to print something, you don't have to go over to a copy machine, or if you're really old, the old mimeograph machines. <laughs> you just press a button and it goes to print. You keep on typing. If you make a mistake, backspace, backspace, backspace. If you want to move some stuff around, copy, paste. And never have to stop typing. If you want to need to file it, you just file it in a file in, in your computer or in the network and never have to stop typing, and that's why PCs caused a lot more problems, plus people were having ergonomic issues. You know, now if you go to the internet, there's a lot of sites that show you how to use a personal computer ergonomically. And when I say ergonomics, I get people who get stuck in the fact, oh, I used an ergonomic keyboard once and I didn't like it. Well, get that out of your head. Um, you can use any keyboard ergonomically as long as you know how to use a keyboard correctly and you have your monitor set up and whatnot. But now, fewer and fewer people are using PCs. They're using laptops and guess what? Or tablets or smartphones. So anytime, anytime your screen and your keyboard are close together, what happens? You're either looking down at the screen or your hands are up. 
If your hands are up, that causes shoulder problems, that causes posture imbalances and whatnot. And it's worse with a small thing like, <laughs> like a smartphone or a tablet. So what do you do with a laptop? The easiest thing to do is get a box, put the computer, your top laptop on a box, get a separate keyboard, separate mouse, and use it more like a PC, and then go to an ergonomic site and see how to set those up. Smartphones, a lot worse. And that's why more problems are happening with a uh, false carpal tunnel with people having their head down a lot whether it's tablets or smartphones or whatever, because your head weighs about the same as a bowling ball. And every inch forward puts an extra 10 or 12 pounds on the back of your neck and the back of your shoulders. And so what's happening, I've seen 12-year-old kids with humpbacks. And they're just texting away or playing games, whatever, on their smartphones. And that causes not only neck pain, back pain, could, can cause numbness in the front of the hands uh, and <laughs> just being a hunchback. And you might say, well, I know a lot of old people, they got hunchbacks and they never use a computer or a smartphone. Well, your body, it's a use it or lose it thing. You take those same people and you ask them to raise their arm like that, they can go like that. Why? They haven't used it. So when muscles are not used, the tendency of the body is to curl itself into a ball, and then you die. Well, the same thing is if overuse. Overuse of the muscles in front of you, which most people use the muscles in front of them, not the muscles behind. So they're not stretching out, they're not reaching up, and the muscles in the front get tighter, causing you to <laughs> roll into a ball, and you're going to die. Let me just show you one thing you can do. Uh, for your posture is preferably standing up, but I'm not going to stand up, is you've got a curve in the low back. Straighten that out so it's more straight, so you're losing the curve. Take your chest and pretend that there's a, a string from your chest, breastbone to your ceiling, and then you want to pull your neck back. I'm not like that. Not like this. Well, that, that that's not so bad, but pull it back with a double chin. And hold that position for five minutes, ten times. Now, what if I don't have that much time? Do it once. Do it for 30 seconds. Do it for whenever you can, but make sure that you stretch yourself back so you're unwinding yourself and then and so forth i have a freebie for you i have a five part free video series that talks about things that your doctor does not know or tell you or would not have time to tell you because most medical doctors only have between eight to fifteen minutes with you you spend a lot of time. doctors are symptom followers they manage the symptoms and not go after what's causing it. And if you really go after what's causing it, not just because you play a musical instrument, therefore, no, something's happening in between the fact that you play a musical instrument and you have numbness. Or you do weights and you have numbness. So get my free five-part video series. My name is Hilma Volk, carpaltunnelmaster.com, and you...